Hello and welcome to part 23 of our podcast series, Unraveling the Revelation, a detailed look at the influences on the Church of God's interpretation of the book of Revelation. I'm Dale Rood. If you have any comments, questions, or criticism, please feel free to share those with me at responding to religious ramblings at gmail.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can get updates when new material is available. Also, if you enjoy this, or even if you don't enjoy this, feel free to share it with a friend at res responding to religious ramblings with an underscore in between those words on YouTube. I've included a fair use disclaimer on this episode because I will be showing some videos and I wanted to make sure everyone understood that I'm using these as, um, in, as described here in this fair use disclaimer. So you can read that. I'm using this for the purpose of teaching and research. And so I wanted to include this um, because I will be using some videos. Okay, for this podcast series, we want to talk about the Church of God Restoration. Now, someone may ask, well, why are you talking about the Church of God Restoration when you didn't talk about some of the other seven seal churches? Well, I didn't um, talk about this individual groups because, number one, there's a lot of groups, and I don't want to spend time um, just talking about each individual group. But... I did want to talk about the Church of God Restoration because it's somewhat of an anomaly. And I'll explain that as we go on. The Church of God Restoration was founded by Daniel Wilborn, or people called him Danny Lane. He was born on March the 30th, 1944, in Ashland, Kentucky, and he was converted in May of 1980. He died September the 21st, 2011, at the age of 67 in California. He's buried in the Church of God Restoration Cemetery in Greenville, Ohio. He was succeeded by a young man that he mentored for a few years. His name is Ray Tinsman. Uh, oftentimes when people would um, describe brother lane they would say that he was called to be an apostle he restored what had been lost through the awful and disastrous spiritual silence which began in the early 1900s <clears throat> brother lane wrote a book called he lifted me out and you can see a picture of it there on the left hand side Let's talk a little bit about some personal information about Brother Lane. So he's the fun of, son of Henry Lane, a Church of God Anderson pastor. Um, Brother Lane had a Church of God Reformation movement upbringing. In other words, he was part of the movement. And also during his youth and for a short time, he was associated with the Church of God Evening Light or the Saints that rally around the publishing house in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Now, Brother Lane got into sin. He went out into sin, and he um, became a hero heroin addict for about 19 years. And in fact, he lived on the streets of San Francisco. He was converted in 1980, and he worshiped with his parents and his brother in an Anderson congregation initially. But he concluded that it was too quiet and left there shortly afterwards. He was ordained to the ministry in 1984 by Ostas B. Wilson, who is a prominent Church of God Evening Light pastor. And when I say um, Evening Light, know that I'm talking about the fellowship that has rallied around the Faith Publishing House in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Brother Lane was the author of a small booklet, about 23 pages, titled He Lifted Me Out, and it was published in July of 1984. It was published by Faith Publishing House. 
Brother Lane left the Church of God Evening Light, Guthrie, Oklahoma, in spring of 1988 with a significant following of younger ministers, and the reason for his departure from that particular movement was, he would often say, sleepy ministers and deadness. Now, I was acquainted with Brother Danny Lane. There's a picture of him and I in the uh, camp in the camp meeting uh, tabernacle there in West Milton. So I had met some of the saints from the Dayton Avenue, or the Dayton Church of God, which was located on Tyrome Avenue. And I'd met them um, through a, almost like a coincidence uh, type of, um, of a situation. One of the brothers worked at a grocery store, and some of the saints came in. And it was about 1988, maybe a little bit before that, somewhere around in there. And uh, so we, we all became acquainted, and we spent time together and just fellowshipping and getting to know each other and had a great time. And I didn't realize that at the time, but they were just leaving the Church of God there on Tyron Avenue in Dayton, Ohio. And this particular congregation was affiliated with the Evening Light Church of God. And it was so interesting because I grew up in Springfield, Ohio, which is just a short distance away from Dayton, Ohio. Um, and I had never met anyone at that time. I don't believe I had met anyone from the Evening Light Church of God. And I didn't even know that a congregation existed over there. So meeting new saints, it was a time of excitement. And we had we just really had a good time. Uh, they would come over and visit. We'd have dinners together. and we, It just was a great time. And so I began attending several meetings with the saints at that time. And um, in fact, I attended all of the early camp meetings in West Milton until about 2003. Um, I was never part of that movement. I did not embrace the, um, uh, you know, the overall idea of it. Um, but they were great people, great people. Um, when I first met them, you know, I, would, I loved going to their meetings. They were always so sweet and kind. And I had not been used to that in some circles that I had visited. Um, I didn't get, get quite that uh, a reception. And if you know anything about the Church of God, especially the Seventh Seal and uh, the Two Cleansing Church of Gods, if you have not embraced that teaching or if you're an outsider uh, and you attend a place that at one time did, they're almost hostile. And, and to you and it's really sad but I had experienced that firsthand so when I met these saints and while they taught to cleansing they were just loving and kind and it was legitimate uh, and I really enjoyed going to their meetings but I just didn't I wouldn't have any interest in joining um, that particular group um, but I did meet Danny Lane through them and and I don't consider him we weren't good friends but I would go out to his house and visit I had a job where I traveled a lot and I had to go to California quite frequently. And he lived right outside Los Angeles. And so um, not only did I go hear him preach when he was here in Ohio, I would go out and visit him at his uh, little place out there. Super nice man. We just, you know, it was just, it was just a, a great time. Uh, I really, really liked him. And he was very open. He was easy to talk to. And you could talk to him about differences that you had or, you know, difference in our upbringing. And he would... He, you know, he'd almost um, laugh about it. He, he wasn't hostile or anything. And so sometimes when I would go out there with him, we would go to some meetings out there. And, uh, and certainly I would attend the congregation there in um, uh, California, right outside of Los Angeles. And um, just funny stories. As I'm telling this now, I remember one instance because they, they didn't believe in musical instruments. And we went to go visit um, the tabernacle there, where he, the little chapel where they, um, where they were meeting. It was a little storefront place. And some of the saints lived upstairs. And so we would go downstairs and have meeting, and we'd sing a cappello. But then we'd go upstairs, literally walk outside, walk up the stairs, and we'd have fellowship up there. And, and Brother Lane played the piano, and we'd sit around and sing with the piano. <laughs> so it was like okay if you were downstairs no music but if you're upstairs you can have music and it was just little stuff like that that just struck me funny I, you know i wasn't in i wasn't 
<laughs> ingrained in all the doctrinal part of all this. It just little things like that would, would make me laugh. Uh, I remember another story. We were sitting at a restaurant one time and we were talking about uh, neckties. And I said, I said, now why is that you guys don't wear neckties? He said, he said, when I see someone wearing a necktie, he said, they may as well be wearing a necklace. <laughs> And, and like I said, it was just little things like that. It just, it would strike me funny. And, um, but he, he never got offended in our talks. I didn't get offended. It was just a really good time. And he shared a lot of uh, very useful information with me. Some things that I, I've never forgotten. And, uh, and, um, and some of those actually I've included in the, in these podcasts. So, at that time, there was no discussion about seven seals or seven church ages and, and all that. Um, but he was very interested in my background. And so I started taking Emerson Wilson tapes out to him. And, uh, and so we would talk about the seven seal message. And also he was talking to some other brothers. I know I remember the name um, Stacy Branham, Branham, Bramman, uh, who was a pastor in Maud, Oklahoma. I didn't know him. And also um, uh, Clifford Rhymes, who had been out of Chicago, Illinois. They were also contacts that he would talk to about the seventh seal. And so he was gleaning information from us. He was listening to tapes. You know, he was just interested in the subject. I had, I had no idea what would in, end up happening uh, as a result of those contacts. Um, but anyhow, I'll get into that here in a minute. So I saw Brother Lane. When I first met him, he was wearing just regular clothes. Uh, and I say regular clothes, the kind of clothes that you know, most saints that I know and fellowship with wore. Uh, he dressed like the people did at Faith and Victory. He was a little more strict in the, in the uh, length of the sleeves. He wore, he wore um, uh, sleeves down to his uh, wrist. And I remember talking to him about that one day. And I said, I said, how's come you, you do that? Because we, we didn't do that. We, we wore short sleeves. The only time we had to wear long sleeves was whenever we were up and uh, singing in the choir or, you know, up on the platform. Our, our pastor preferred us to wear sleeves. And it's kind of funny, too, because our pastor wanted us to wear neckties on the platform. And here was this whole movement that didn't wear neckties and didn't believe it. So, it, again, it's just, to, to me, that's the kind of stuff it just, it makes me laugh. Uh, not that it's not that it's you know it, it, not a serious situation, and I understand you know how people feel about it. But for me, I'm the kind of person when I see things like that, it just makes me laugh. But I was talking to him about long sleeves. I said, "Well, why do you do that?" And he said, "Well, it's because of modesty." And I said, "Well, so is there any time when you when you guys don't do that? Don't wear long sleeves?" Well, yeah, if we're working outside. You know, uh, we'll, roll, we'll roll our sleeves up, or the women, if they're doing dishes, they'll roll the sleeves up. And I said, well, if it's a modesty issue, I said, why would you do that? If there's men around, or, you know, and the woman's got her sleeves up, and she's in, and you guys are having a fellowship thing, I said, if it was modest, if it was a modesty issue, I can't see you, you know, doing that. Uh, it didn't make sense to me, but, but we would have this kind of discussions, and it was just, it was just a, a time of sharing. And so, um, in fact, as I'm looking at this picture, I remember when this picture was taken. I had brought a brother with me to camp meeting. First time there, he didn't know anybody. And, uh, and so he didn't know, you know, this brother was kind of a, a, a he was a fun to be around guy too. He smiled a lot, laughed. And so I went to go get my picture taken. And Brother Lane, you know, was, they're not accustomed to like laughing in their pictures, smiling. Everything's got to be real sober and somber. And so he wasn't laughing, and my friend's like, hey, come on, come on, laugh, laugh, smile, smile, smile. And he would not show his teeth, so that was the closest to a smile that we got out of him. <laughs> of course, my friend, you know, had no idea what was going on. Um, you know, he didn't have a Church of God background at all. But uh, nonetheless, I, I look back on those days with very fond memories, I really do. Uh, I have very fond memories of those, going to those meetings and and uh, hearing the preaching and meeting the saints. But I also have firsthand experience of seeing the change that took place from just like a traditional faith and victory kind of atmosphere to this um, to seeing him become 
uh, really, I'll use the word radical domineering leader. I saw that take place. And I saw it, I saw it from a distance. I wasn't affiliated with the group, so I don't have any bias one way or the other. I literally saw how it, how it took place and the change that took place. And so I'll tell maybe a little bit of that story in, um, <clears throat> as we go through here. Okay, basically the seven seal philosophy, uh, just to kind of recap a little bit. Um, so Brother Lane's goal was to restore the early message of the sixth seal. And that's pretty much the overall uh, philosophy of all the seven seal groups. They believe that, the, you know, you had the sixth seal, it was a work of God, mighty work of God. They apostatized, and now in the seventh seal message, it's, it's a call to a restoration of what had been there, of what had one time took place. So all of them basically have that same goal. Um, and, and they believe in getting back to the atmosphere of the sixth seal. You're actually getting back to the atmosphere of the New Testament church. Okay, so that was his goal too. And he believed that not only had this uh, message been... Um, apostatized or compromised within the Anderson movement, but he believed that faith and victory movement and other cell movements had departed from that, in, that, that those kind of teachings as well in that kind of environment. By doing so, he believed that the spiritual gifting, including divine healing and the signs and wonders, would be restored to the church if we could just get back to that, that point of restoration. So when I first met them, they weren't even called the Restoration, the Church of God Restoration. They just called themselves the Church of God. But eventually, that name, Church of God Restoration, came into existence and they started using it. And so that's how the whole Restoration thing came about. So Danny Lane believed that the Church of God should be the most conservative body in Christianity, which included appearance in dress that matched that of 1880. That's what he told me. He told me that. And um, him and company would visit other Church of God meetings to proselyte members into his new movement. Eventually, he burned so many bridges that he moved on to proselyte Anabaptist churches. Namely, he's, I think they started out with Christ, uh, Charity Christian Fellowship. They would go there, and they were kind of like a, a movement that got started um, from Amish uh, folks. And, and they also were known as the Remnant Movement. And then he moved on to the Mennonites and the Amish. So this conservative appearance really increased when the connections uh, were made with these Anabaptist churches. That's, that's my observation. Because like I said, when I first met him, uh, he, he dressed like all conservative church of gods do, um, with, with just those exceptions that I mentioned. So also was this message about breaking the silence uh, in heaven, breaking the silence. Uh, Brother Lane believed that the church overall had fallen into silence, including the sleepy Church of God ministers, um, and he would often say that about the faith and victory movement, but also he would include some of the Church of God groups as well. Now, among the Seventh Seal, they're much more expressive in their meetings. Um, and they, it's always been that way. I don't remember it being anything but that way. So there'll be people that shout, they praise God, they jump the aisles, and sometimes they run the aisles. I mean, they're, they're very expressive in Seventh Seal. Um, faith and victory is not that way. Uh, when you go into their meetings, it's very quiet, subdued. Uh, there's a lot of pausing, uh, I, which they interpret as being just waiting on the Spirit of God to inspire someone to testify or something like that. So there is a difference in those kind of gatherings. And um, but Brother Lane, he would really talk. He was really hard on um, the sleepy ministers. So here's a picture of him. On the right-hand side, so, or excuse me, on the left-hand side. So here's Brother Lane and uh, Brother Ray Tinsman when he was younger. And 
there is D.S. Warner on the right-hand side with the hat on and E.E. E. Byram sitting next to him. Now, I, I laugh at this picture because, remember now, I, I knew Danny Lane um, when he was just a normal dressing person. And then I saw this happen. I'll never forget the time I went to one of the camp meetings that I hadn't seen for at least a year. And he had this long beard and he was walking around with this hat on uh, the one there you see in the lower right hand right left hand corner he's walking around with this hat and he had this beard long beard and even had a cane and i don't know why he had a cane other than brother warner had a cane and so <laughs> basically there was just an attempt to try to match the appearance of the six seal church in the in its infancy and um, and that was that was part of the restoration message, and um, anyways, um, that's that's just that. And I remember I saw him, and I was like, "What?" I was, I was like, it's "Innocent me, not knowing what all was, what all was taken." But I was like, "What's up with this beard you got?" <laughs> and once again, we would talk that way. He he just he'd laugh, and I, it wasn't it wasn't anything offensive. He was just a, he was a fun guy to be around. He really was. Um, so yeah so let's talk about 1980 and this is not the 1980 that you see on the seven seal charts that's not what this 1980 date is on the on their revelation charts it's totally different so it was viewed as a prophetic year let me just go real quickly so the early seven seal advocates they held that 1930 was the closing of the sixth seal and the opening of the seven seal so on their chart you see 1930 and then early seven seal advocates believed that the silence was at the end of the seven seal, which would be in 1980. So some of the charts had 1980 on there. So they had 1880, 1930, 1980. And this, was, this interpretation, though, was changed because some of the later seven seal advocates moved that time of silence from the end you know, just prior to the camp of the saints, since that obviously didn't that, that didn't happen, they moved that silence period to the beginning of 1930, around that time. And some of them believe that that silence was broken in about 1950, 1960, when um, when Earl Slakeham, you know, went out and did what he did, and then Brother Emerson came on the scene. So a lot of a lot of the churches will say that was the when the silence was broken. Now, not all of them say that, but um, that's at least one interpretation. Okay, so those dates there are not why this date was on is on the Church of God Restorations charts. So Brother Lane held that about 1930, the Church of God Anderson as a whole ha became apostate, and there was silence in the spiritual heavens for the space of half an hour. This one half an hour was taken to mean 50 years, using one year symbolic language as one century. So Brother Lane believed that the seventh seal was open in 1980, the year he got saved, and that he and his followers broke the silence of the apostasy. So Lane is, oft, is often labeled by his own followers as a holy apostle, pastor, evangelist, Bible scholar, and teacher. So they began to call him a, an apostle. Um, I, don't, I never heard him call him a, himself an apostle, but he possibly did. I just don't have awareness of it. I do know his followers looked to, looked to him as an apostle there towards the end. Okay. So 1980, they see it as a prophetic year. Not for the same reason that the other seven seal advocates did who were wrong. He sees it as the opening of the seven seal, which took place the year he got saved. Okay, so I just wanted to mention this because this is kind of, in my mind, this is kind of part of the transition that was taking place. It's an example of how things begin to change how to how things begin to uh, change so um there had been some helpers that brother lane had and um some of them went together and 
bought some campgrounds in no um nooksack washington well eventually they came to the realization among themselves that he was taking too much control uh, he was making, you know, he was taking over this whole thing, this whole restoration thing. It was becoming all about him. And and so they withdrew from that group. Well, Brother Lane and the people that stayed within the group, they wanted to go take over those campgrounds. So it ended up in court. And uh, you can see the information at the top there. It was over, the court case was over overseen by the Honorable Judge um, Mayahan, and it was at Whatcom County Superior Court, State of Washington, case number, you can see it up there, uh, and it was the Church of God was the plaintiff, and I withheld the name here um, because I don't want to really get involved in personnel stuff, uh, people that's no longer even associated with this restoration. Uh, so he basically is a lawsuit against them. They were the defendants. And this, this case went before the judge or was either ruled um, by the judge, rendered uh, a, ju a, render, a ruling was rendered by the judge in July of 2001. Okay, so I'm just going to read this because this is, this is the opinion of a judge who obviously he's not Church of God. He doesn't have a bias. He's there to be a judge to hear all sides of the story and then reach a conclusion. So let me just read, um, lead you, read you part of this. Um, so let me kind of describe, set up the environment before we start getting into some of the quotes. Uh, court records show that Daniel Lane, Ray Tinsman, and a couple other Church of God ministers attempted to take control of the Nooksack Church of God campgrounds, arguing that the saints in Washington had, quote-unquote, left the Church of God and was no longer in harmony with the ministerial body, unquote. The ruling came down on whether came down to whether or not the church was governed hierarchically or congregationally. So legal counsel representing the saints in Washington argued that the Church of God is congregationally governed governed and therefore not under the edicts the edicts of a pope like figure or someone at the head of this thing, that everything is basically decided at the congregational level. Okay, so I just went through the, the ruling. Um, it's out there, available. You can do a Google search on it. and uh, So I'm just going to read some of the quotes there. So this is what the judge had to say in his oral decision. Now, you know that the Roman Catholic Church is hierarchical. The Pope, cardinals, bishops, and priests are all appointed by somebody else and people when they join those churches they know that now that's however that's however i think clearly because of the fact that many people objected to the types of edicts that came from a hierarchical structure that congregational churches became popular nobody likes to be told by somebody in Rome, what they're supposed to be doing next week. If they're going to decide, they decide, they will decide for themselves. And so this is what he goes on to say. He says, regardless of what Daniel Lane said, and he was referring to the fact that Brother Lane was make, was attempting to make the, the um, biblical argument that the Church of God was congregationally governed, governed. He says, despite or regardless of what Lane said, here he seemed to indicate that it was a hierarchical thing. So this judge was basically saying, okay, I'm hearing these arguments, and I'm, I'm hearing that even brother this Daniel Lane guy is saying that, yeah, the congregations are, are um, you know, they're congregationally governed, but some of the things that he was saying was leading the judge to believe that this, that wasn't the case at all. It's, it's hierarchy all. Okay, so let me read on. Seems to me that Daniel Lane realized that he was losing control of the Nooksack congregation. He executed a power play 
by convincing the other members that, name withheld, had left the Church of God and was no longer in harmony with the ministerial body. If the actions of Daniel Lane were to be upheld, then the Nooksack congregation would be evicted from their own campground that they had struggled so hard to provide for themselves. They would have no effective place to worship in Whatcom County. Contrary to their intents, title to the campground would be transferred to a church in California. So after he heard all the arguments, he basically said, ruled in favor of the saints in Washington and against Danny Lane, and they were able to keep the campgrounds. Okay, so he goes on and he says this. A judge can remove a director only if the court finds that a director acted fraudulently or with dishonesty towards the corporation and if the removal would be in the best entrance of interest of the corporation. While I think there may be sufficient facts here that would authorize me to remove Mr. Lane as the director, I'm not willing to do so at this time. If for some reason or another it, ca it came back to me that there were other actions that needed to be taken or that could be taken, at that point I would consider it. So basically what he ended up concluding, the judge did, was that um, the campgrounds were being taken over by an, an external entity and they were using the arguments that they well they left the truth they left they left they're not in harmony with them and so this is now our con our campgrounds and and um of course brother lane was making the argument it sounded like that this was there was some hierarchical thing and then that he was at the top of it he was the director and so the judge says you know i can remove him um if necessary, I'm not going to do it right now, but if something else comes back to me, I will consider it. And so he ruled in favor of the saints. Well, that was, uh, that was a lot to um, happen early on. This is in 2000, 2001, when all this took place. And, um, and so they did learn their lesson through that for the most part. And the Church of God Restoration has since set up a tax-exempt nonprofit corporation called the Church of God Restoration slash Ministerial Body Incorporated, whose pre predecessor, 501K, was listed as the Church of God Incorporated. And it was even listed as a Protestant corporation. I, I don't know if that was, I'm sure that was on, on the part of the people who kept the records. Because I can't see Brother Lane saying that they were a Protestant corporation. Um, and so uh, the Church of God Restoration Ministry Body Incorporated holds between, according to records, uh, one and five million dollars in assets, and this board oversees all church assets. Ray Tinsman is now the corporate president, and online records show that five other apostles were listed in the predecessor 501C as personnel. Most recent records available online are from November 2016. So basically what this is saying is that they had learned the lesson about this whole legal thing. And so on the legal side, they created a, a, um, a, a, a 501C. Initially it was called the Church of God. Uh, initially it was called the Church of God Incorporated. And then most recently then they've changed uh, and either applied for a new license or I'm not sure how that works. Um, but now it's called the Church of God Restoration slash Ministerial Body Incorporated. And so that now is their legal entity to handle business affairs. Okay, and there are people that um, have had, you know, issues that, um, they've, they've, that have involved this kind of legal activity. Uh, but I'm not going to go into all that. All right, so... Away from all the legalese and all the, you know, administrative stuff, let's get to some fun stuff. Um, so the Church of God Restoration has revelation charts, as I already talked about. And this one here 
is the first chart that they have. Now I'm going to tell you a little story about this chart. So um, my mother became sick in the mid-1990s and it looked like she wasn't going to uh, live. And so I, uh, my mother was an artist and she actually painted this chart and she painted another chart. Um, and so I thought, well, it'd be kind of nice if I could find the chart my mom painted. I was only, uh, I probably was only about five years old when she painted this. And, but I remember it. I remember mom working on it, st stretching it out across the floor of the dining room table. And at one point she even had a little place in the chapel and worked on it. And we'd all go out there. And when she was doing that, we'd run out in the yard and play and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so anyways, it looked like she was going to die. And so I, uh. I thought, well, it'd be nice if mom could see that chart again. So I, I, I ended up uh, tracking it down and do a, um, a, a, a process, I'll put it that way. I found out Brother Lane had it. And, of course, by this time, you know, we're all friends. We're friends, and I talked to him about everything. So I remember calling him. I was like, hey, you know that Revelation chart you got? He said, yep. He said, I said, uh, my mom painted that back in the 60s. He said, oh, no, 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 no way, no way. He said, that chart looks like it's new. I said, no. And I, I asked him, I said, did you get it from so, brother so-and-so? He said, yeah. I said, well, my pastor had loaned it to brother so-and-so. And, and I, said, I said, I'd like to get that chart back. He said, what? He's like, I, I had a business deal with this guy. So this guy uh, had, had, had been loaned the chart and the agreement was that my pastor had said, as long as you're using the chart or until you have another one made, you can use it. Well, he had it for so long, apparently he assumed uh, ownership or maybe didn't remember the stipulations or whatever. And he ended up uh, in a business deal with Brother Lane. And so they swapped. So Brother Lane ended up with this chart. And so I told him, I was like, yeah, that, that's it. That is the chart. That's it. If you got that from that brother, I said, that, that is. And he's like, well, I didn't know I had stolen property. And that was his word, stolen property. Because he had just excommunicated this guy from their group. First guy that was ever excommunicated from the Church of God Restoration. So they, they, they're now not allowed to talk. They're not allowed to communicate. He's not, this guy's not allowed to have contact with the saints. And, and he said the only way that they could have contact is if this guy was going to repent. And, you know, and, and so forth. So I didn't want to get in the middle, uh, uh, middle of a big mess. All I wanted was the chart. So Brother Lane, when he heard the story, uh, to his credit, he said, I'll get you that chart. He said, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have it mailed to you. This was after, this was after a little time had passed. Uh, when I say time, I'm talking about a couple years. I just left it with the Lord and mom was getting sicker. And I just left it with the Lord, and I said, oh, I just, I just hope it all works out. Well, he called me one day and said, hey, I'm going to send you this chart. He said, we're having a new chart painted. And uh, he said, uh, let me uh, mail it to you. I said, ah, oh, let's just hold on. I said, just uh, bring it to camp meeting, and I'll just meet you over there at camp meeting. He said, well, that works too. I said, okay, well, and at this point, it was getting close to camp meeting time over in West Milton. So um, I went over there. And I, I actually had to take a break from my work. And on a, on a break, I ran over there. I wouldn't be able to attend the meeting uh, at that particular day. But I went over there and um, I picked up the chart. It's in a box. And so we were in the bookstore back that little, uh, little room off to the back where they kept some supplies. And so we were back there, man, just laughing, talking and, and everything, you know, like we always did. And uh, so he gave me the chart. I left. And, um, but uh, before I left, he walks out and he walks out of the bookstore. And I'm still in the bookstore. I thought, well, yeah, I love books. I look around and see what they have. <laughs> and I'll never, I, will, I don't think I'll ever forget this. I looked over in the, in the bookstore and there was this picture of what I thought was D.S. Warner. And being a guy that loves history and, and uh, you know, and doing all this research and I just love, you know, the history of the Church of God. I knew I had not seen that pose before, 
But I thought, wow, someone found it. Someone's found another picture of D.S. Warner, and there's only just a handful of pictures of him that exist. I'm like, well, that's that's pretty that's pretty cool. Let me go over and see. And so I walked over there, and I wear glasses. I didn't have my glasses on. Uh, and got over there, and here it was a picture of Brother Lane. They were selling his picture in the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> and so the saints would buy his picture. Some of them had it up on their walls. I was like, what? What in the world is going on? I've been to a lot of camp meetings, and I've never seen anybody sell pictures of their particular leader or, you know, whatever. But that's what happened. And so that was just another, it was just another, for me, it was just another red flag. It's like, what is going on? You know, what is happening here? And uh, so anyhow, I get home. I bring the chart home. I'm so excited. My mom, you know, gets to see this. She's going to get to see this chart. I open up the box and lo and behold, it was changed. <laughs> so you can see at the top, the dates, 33, 270, 530, 1530, 1730, and 1880. Okay, yeah, that's on the seven seal charts, all of them. And then remember, now we have early seven seal, the group I was part of, had 1930 on there. Okay, well, that's gone. But instead, you got 1980. And 1980 was supposed to be the opening up of the seven seal. Remember, I told you just the last couple slides, Brother Lane had 1980 on there because that's the year he got saved. And so he basically started teaching that his, he opened up the seven seal and that he was preaching this. And some of the members I've talked to said he didn't even acknowledge where he got the information from or that there was this other seven seal, you know, movement that had been out there. And, but he just was preaching this. And of course that was new to them because a lot of them people came from faith and victory. Faith and victory doesn't talk much about revelation so it was it was like really exciting to them and they thought he was just god was just giving him this new understanding when in reality it was it was just stuff that he had heard from these resources and he modified them and tweaked them to basically fit the environment that he was in and and that he um and that he opened up the seal Okay, so I saw that and I was like, oh no. I was, I was trying to, you know. So anyhow, make a long story short. Um, so let me back up a little bit. So there were some other changes that were made. Now, the actual chart that I have, what Brother Lane had done was he had taken a patch and put on there. So... He didn't actually change the paint on 1980. It had been 1930 that was there. He just changed the three to an eight. Or it, well, he would have just changed the three to eight, but he put the patch on there instead. So he had taken that patch off. So when I got the chart, it showed 1930 on there. But that's because the patch was removed. But the other patches, he left on there. So you see in the middle there in Pergamos, there's a patch of an angel. Okay, there were other changes that he made. For instance, Mystery Babylon there. Um, when my mom painted the chart, and I, don't, I didn't include this on this one, I should have, but when my mom painted the chart, she made, she made her look like a, a whore, right? Because that's how she's described. So she was, you know, I mean, mom didn't, you know, uh, paint her that, in a way that was just like totally, totally immodest. Um, but Brother Lane... <laughs> They made the change to that. They put long sleeves on her and a long dress. Okay. So so those were made all throughout the, the chart there. And um, anyways, those changes were made. And uh, so what you see here in this chart, um, yeah, it still has the patch there in the middle. And then the patch is removed from the 1930 there um and i just made that so that you could see it was 1980 actually brother lane ended up having a um prints of this made and so in the prints it shows the 1980 and so this is kind of a combination of what he had printed and and my mother's uh, original chart 
So the good news is, um, before mom passed, well, she actually got better. That's a, little, a whole other testimony. She got better, and uh, God moved on her, and she lived for a lot longer than uh, that w was expected. But she got to see this chart, and I was so happy about that, and that was my goal all along. So and I'll never forget the time when, when we were having that discussion about mom and that chart. He told me, he says, oh, I hate to get rid of this chart. He said, I use this chart to open up the seven seal. And he said, I've taken this to several different countries. This chart right here is what opened up the seven seal. And I said, Brother Lane, come on. I said, you know, they were preaching that back in the 1930s, way back then. <laughs> but he did not accept that, uh, what they were saying uh, as being the case. He, he, he had his own version of it. So there's a story, the story on the, um, on the first chart that the restoration used, and more specifically that Brother Lane used to open up the seventh seal. Okay, so here's another chart. Uh, they had this one painted. It's not, doesn't look like it's showing up real well here on my screen. I hope it shows up better uh, elsewhere. But um, so this was kind of a busy chart, um, and I think this one was. Um, was painted maybe by one of the German brethren, and um, but you can see the dates at the cross at the top. You can see the far right hand side, 1980. Okay, now this chart here, I actually have this chart too. One of the uh, ex members gave me gave me this chart. This was the um, this was the I think probably the next chart after the German one. The German was very busy, and so um, this here shows. You know, it's typical stuff we see on the left-hand side. We've all seen that before. And then you see the dates across the top, and you see 1980. Uh, pretty much the same layout as uh, Mom's chart um, and all the Seven Seal chart, except with the exception of uh, the date change there. But what I noticed when I got this chart, I'm like, are you kidding me? So we got Mystery Babylon there. We got the, the, the Great Harlot. And here they painted... Jan Crouch's <laughs> picture, her, her head on the Revelation symbol. So if you all know who Jan Crouch is, she's, uh, she's uh, part of the Trinity Broadcast Network. Uh, and, you know, uh, just some... Anyways, Trinity Broadcast, I'll just leave it there. You can look it up yourself if you want to see what it's all about. But they put her head on a symbol and i saw that i just uh, me everything i i just had to crack up i was like are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me you're gonna make this symbol here and you're gonna put some real person's head on it <laughs> so oh my i tell you you can't make this stuff up all right well so that was uh one of their previous charts okay and then now this is their new one and so um, this was just painted in, or not painted. This is actually a digit, a digit of a digital type of thing. So this was all done on computer, and um, it was uh, completed in 2019. They had the unveiling, and all that. And so um, this is what it looks like. And as you see, same dates across the top, 1980. Okay. Pretty much, um, you know. Might might be some tweaking of a few things here and there, but the overall message is, is still um, what had been taught in the early years of the Seven Seal Movement um, and what was taught by Brother Lane. Okay, but now there are some differences, okay? Let me show you what happened. See that 1980 there? That angel that's pouring out that vial? They put Brother Lane's head on there. That's Brother Lane. So basically they said he is the angel that poured out that fourth vial. Got his picture on there. Okay. So let's move on. Now, Brother Lane's dead. He's gone. Now they've got Ray Tinsman, Steve Hargrave, and Randy Hargrave, three of the chief apostles, or the chief apostle and his helpers, they got their heads on there. No kidding. They put their faces on these symbols. 
Not only that, but that symbol on the right-hand side of the chart of the New Jerusalem that came down from out and it had the gates and all that. They put the names of their apostles on there. Opal, um, Tves Tveskia, Hildebrandt, Tinsman, Hargrave, and O'Shea. So basically what they have done is, you know, before in Seven Seal, you know, Brother Goodnight felt like the seal was open when he wrote a book. Okay, but they, they didn't put their pictures on there. But still, it was all about, you know, he wrote this book and that opened up the seventh seal. Warner had done the same thing with the sixth seal. Okay. But now they're, they've taken Revelation symbols and personalized them. Brought it down to an individual. And put their likeness on the chart. Okay. Like I said, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. You cannot make this stuff up. All right, so I'm going to, rather than you just hear me say this stuff, I want you to hear them saying this stuff from, them, oh, from their own, their own uh, messages. So let me just say that there's a lot of information out here that's available. Um, they, have, uh, they have live streams, they've got videos, um, they've got, they go on various social media platforms. Um, with these messages and, and their message and so forth. And I, I encourage you to go take a look at it. Um, I'm going to click over top of this. Well, I, actually, I can't click on that. But um, you can go on their YouTube channel. at uh, It's called At The Church of God. And you can see these videos. And I encourage you to go out there and look at them in their entirety. i only going to show you clips. Okay, I don't have time to wait. Some of these things go on for hours, an hour or more. Um, uh, we're not going to obviously do that here. I'm just trying to get you a few clips to, so you can get a feel for what's going on. Because people are talking about, the, about this stuff. It's going on social media. There's a lot of watchdog groups now that have gotten involved. Ex-members are coming out of the cracks. Uh, they're leaving and going to social media and they're telling their story. You'll see some of this here. There's a, there's a, um, on Facebook, there's a Church of God Restoration Cult Warning uh, Facebook page. There's one called Cult Busters. There's one called Christianity, Culture, and Cults. And there's, a, there's, there's more. I, I, I just gave you some sampling. You can just go search, search these things for yourself, and you'll see what these people are, ex-members, are saying. Now, true, they're ex-members, so they're going to have their perspective, and they're going to have their bias, Right? And so they may say things that uh, out there from their perspective. So I don't want to just take what they have to say. I want you to hear it straight from the lips of the people who said it within the restoration. All right. Um, and so, again, I'm using this under the fair use dis uh, disclaimer there, which allows uh, researchers and uh, teachers uh, to share clippets clip of information. So that's why, I'm, uh, that's why I put that disclaimer on there. Okay, so let me see if now here's the here's the thing. I've never done a video before on these podcasts, so let's just hope this works out. I'm going to um, move this microphone over here by my speaker and hopefully this comes out good. So bear with me. This is about eight minutes long, so uh, but I feel like it's worthy of um, a listening to, so you can hear it for yourself. Maybe 
in me. And so the Lord takes him, carries him away out of AD 96 and brings him to 2022, 2020, 2021. And who knows, who knows how far, I don't know just how far, but he takes him and, 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 and gives him a tour, a tour of what was going to happen, humanly speaking, or what had happened, divinely speaking. So John could take courage, that's part one, but, but part two is so that John could specifically write about the things that he saw because we needed his prophecy. But you say, well, you all think, you all teach the revelation, most of the revelation is talking about you all. Yes! Of course! So that he would write it. We actually instructed him to write it. With some instructions of not what to write. Because if he wrote too much, my name would have probably been in there. December the 12th of 19 of 1895 and it wasn't long after his death all of a sudden they lost their their separation from other denominations and began to court with the world and all of a sudden it wasn't long they had tales I see FG Smith in there we could talk about others we should we, we could even we ought to have a little pictures of FG Smith and with this Put them on the tails. Byram. Regal. I think Naylor is somewhere in the dark clouds. He's not even on the tail. I don't like Naylor at all. Stop thinking of Paul the Apostle as greater than Brother Ray. Stop it. You're wrong when you think like that. You're wrong. You're wrong about that. I love Paul the Apostle. And God willing, he'll be one of the first people I talk to when I get to heaven. Oh, I love Paul. I love how he writes. I love how he gets a little smart aleck sometimes. I love how I love how he gets sharp when he needs to. But brother, I'm telling you something. And some of y'all don't get this tonight. There's someone in this room whose ministry is greater whose ultimate understanding is greater, whose prophetic significance is greater than James, John, Peter, and yes, Paul, the Apostle. And as I was praying, I knew I was getting nowhere. Nowhere. I got up on my knees and I looked up at the ceiling knowing I couldn't see any further than that. But I said, Lord, I'm going to do something. That's unusual, maybe. It's not, but it seemed like at that, that time. 
I'm going to start praying another way. And I began to pray and I said, Lord, I come to you in the name of our chief apostle, Brother Ray Tinsman. It's what I did. This is what I did. I'm not talking about being mystical. I'm talking about being right where I needed to be. And I'm telling you, I knew I tapped into something. Yes, sir. I did know that. Amen. Something was already changing just from that announcement. Amen. I began, I got encouraged in my pray. Yes. And I'm telling you, the room filled with the glory of God that night. There wasn't a doubt in my mind that heaven was in that room. There was no question. I didn't quite know actually where to go from there. I'd opened up something I didn't quite know what to do with. And brethren, tonight I'm a free man. I'm telling you tonight, I'm free. Free like I've never been free. is the, the the only name the name that is above all names on this creature of God's creatures is that clear enough for you all right the governor of the world the judge of all this world is the chief apostle our very own brother D. Ray Tinsman. Okay, well, you heard it yourself, so I'm not even going to provide any commentary on it. Um, you've heard it yourself, and uh, you can reach your own conclusions. Okay, so here we have um, the general ministerial body of the Church of God, uh, Restoration. So um, you can see on the right-hand side, they have a number of people... Um, that they identified as apostles. And, uh, and then on the other side, there are people that um, are just leaders, the apostles. I think they call some of them prophets, elders, pastors. I, I don't know all the titles that they, they've given them, but those, uh, that's kind of, of what they, uh, uh, that's kind of um, how they're operating these days. So let me just give you a, a summary here and this is again from my my perspective they have a very strong focus on prophetic teaching they're currently under the direction of their chief apostle Ray Tinsman they're governed by appointed apostles prophets and other church leaders uh, they are openly now calling Greenville Ohio the congregation there their headquarters um, and as you, anyone with the Church of God back, background knows that we typically, we believe that our headquarters is in heaven where the head's at. But they are openly now saying that their headquarters is in Greenville, Ohio, where their chief apostle um, is located. They have periodicals that they publish, including the Gospel Trumpet paper and the Shining Light paper, which are both um, names that was used in the Sixth Seal as well as other uh, liter literature. They do maintain um, social media president presence, and um, you can see I'm, I'm ho hovering over their link there. It's the churchofgod.com, not the church of God, I'm sorry. It's churchofgod.com. So I would invite you to go there and take a look at, uh, at them and um, their literature and everything I've showed you. They've got their videos out there and everything. So, once again, you can see these things in, in their full entire length. They do have quite a, a, high, a high turnover rate with many ex-members also involved on social media 
And oftentimes they'll protest their meetings. They'll go out in front of their meetings and they'll have signs and and uh, there's been uh, uh, skirmishes out there between people uh, fighting and uh, even some vulgarity that was used by one of the one of the members of the Church of God Restoration. It's uh, it's unbelievable what's happening. They have experienced some legal setbacks. Uh, they've had their set of um, hope, high profile moral fa failures and again the sizable split in 2000. They are now being watched by a number of watchdog groups including professional cult monitors such as the cult education group and you can see their um, website there it's called the culteducation.com operated by Rick Ross as well as other independent monitors. Uh, they're currently going through some, appears to be going through some internal changes in preparation for what they believe will be the masses coming to join their ranks. And so uh, they're making some moves internally. They've, got, they've even got some um, youth camps that's, that is pretty militant, actually. Um, when I say militant, they teach them how to shoot guns and all kinds of things. Um, so they make their presence known on hotbed social issues such as COVID restrictions and vaccinations. So they were out there uh, in protest, <clears throat> visible protest. Um, other th social injustice uh, during the George Floyd uh, incident there, they were out there and sent some, some of their people out there um, to stand in protest. And also a number of the Black Lives Matter movement, they're really getting into that, getting into that these days. Uh, they've gone to political events. One thing to their credit, they get out there on these issues and make, them, make themselves known. Um, they do that, and I have to give them credit. So let me just, let me just say this. I'm going to say this as a, uh, from my perspective. We should really pray for these people because this is not how they started out. Uh, I, I said they were just the most humblest, meekest, kindest people you, you could meet. And it's disappointing to me to see how it went from that to what's going on now. I, I can't even hardly see the correlation between the two. And in fact, they've even said, I heard one of, the, um, one of their apostles said, if we preached to you six years ago or some length of time, just a short, if we preached this, what we're doing now, back then he said, you, you all would have emptied this house. And it's true, they would have. Brother Lane, I, I, he would roll in his grave, I think, if he saw what was going on, my opinion. So I do pray for you all. You know, if you're listening to this, I, I really do pray for you. I hope that you get back on track. I think you need to hit the reset button and, and uh, you know, and uh, go in reverse a little because this is not right. This is, uh, this is way too extreme, the things that's happening out there now. So that's just my perspective. And um, anyways, I'm done with that. This, this, uh, got just a couple more slides. So let's take a real quick glance at other recent Church of God ministers involved in the seventh seal. So there's a brother by the name of uh, Earl Wilson. He was born in 1931. He died in 2017. Um, and he had uh, he was the pastor of Rock Chapel Church of God in Granite Falls for 38 years. They actually had a publishing house down there. He authored um, and uh, was the writer of numerous articles and, and books. He was a co-laborer with Brother Emerson Wilson. And I have a picture there of a commentary he did. It's probably, in my judgment, one of the better commentaries that really break down the book of Revelation, you know, uh, not by verse by verse, but certainly close to verse by verse. A lot of good information there. And uh, this brother was also a seven seal um, and held traditional seven seal interpretations. And then there was a brother in Paul, uh, by the name of Paul Weaver. He was the pastor of Sharonville, Ohio Church of God. And um, he had a ministry focus on Revelation back in the 70s and 80s. And this is a picture of the chart that he used. And sometimes we travel down there to revivals and, and he, would, he would travel around and preach for different congregations. And he had um, a lot of uh, a focus on, on this particular kind of stuff. And he just died um, in August of 2023. 
And then there's Brother Earl Borders. He is a pastor of the Church of God in Somersville, West Virginia. Brother Borders is, a, is an author and writer. He has written uh, a lot of different books, very, very good books uh, on a number of subjects. And they're published by the, um, the uh, Gospel Trumpeter Publishing House there in Newark, Ohio. Um, and I, I, I mentioned him because he did a series, a six-volume series on the book of Revelation. And um, it's, uh, it does a good job of describing the seven seal teaching as it's been known. And you can actually go to their website. I'm going to click over here so you can see it. It's the church-of-god-online.com and then slash summersville.publications.html. You can go there, and you can download those for free. They come as Adobe files, and um, very very good uh, as far as explaining the, the probably the more um, modern interpretation of Revelation. So you're not going to find the 1980 stuff in there. You're not going to find the Camp of the Saints in there, and, you know, and... and, and uh, He's expanded on some of the other symbols uh, beyond what Brother Goodnight and, and some of these others have done. So just wanted to throw that out there for your consideration. If you're interested in that, you can go there. I also wanted to mention my pastor, uh, 43 years, Brother William Wilson, Brother Bill Wilson. He was a, a great teacher. Uh, that was a copy of our new Revelation chart. And I say new. We started using that back in the 70s, mid-70s. And... Um, and, uh, you know, pretty decent chart, actually, uh, but laid out the same way as we would expect to see all the other ones. And he was very gifted. Brother, one, one thing about Brother Wilson, he was able to take the historical stuff and talk about that, but then, more importantly, talk about the application to where we are now. And so it wasn't just the old, but he had the old and he had the new. Uh, very gifted um, brother. I really appreciate him. And then also there's Brother Clifford Rhymes. Um, he was born in 1960, and he died in 2022. Now, he was mentored by Brother Frank Gordon, who was the brother of Brother Willie Gordon there in Chicago. He pastored in Racing, Wisconsin, Fort Myers, South Carolina, and Atlanta, Georgia. He was a dedicated Bible scholar and author of many Christian books and literature. And he also had a particular focus on prophetic studies. <clears throat> and his videos are available online at, you can just Google the North Atlanta Church of God. And there's the link there. I won't read that one. That's a YouTube link. But you can pause your um, presentation here and you can see that. So sadly, Brother Rhymes um, died apparently because of complications of severe burns that he experienced in a house fire in December 2021. So he's uh, over 30% of his body was very badly burned and he ended up getting uh, infections and so forth and he passed away. And he and I worked on some things together. Uh, I think the last project we worked on together was... Um, uh, just documenting the the song books of the Church of God, I have a a complete set of song books going back from the first one clear all the way through, and so I scanned them for him and we worked together on on presenting those and um, and what information you know who 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 all worked on them and that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm sad I'm sad that what happened to him. It's really it's a really sad thing because we lost a a good brother. And then, last but not least, I like to talk about Brother Whitehead. Brother Whitehead, him and his family has been singing for years, probably about as long as I can remember. And uh, uh, just really, they were even part of a group that did that traveled around uh, back, way back in the day and sang, put, out, put some albums out. But he really likes to uh, preach and, and talk about Revelation. He wrote this song that you see here, Are You Following the Lamb? <laughs> It's a pretty good song, and uh, he sings it, and the saints really have, uh, you know, get excited whenever that song's being sung. So I just put it on there. You can see the words. You can take your time reading it. But with that, 
that is all I have to share. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Again, a little different than what we've been talking about before, but I wanted to, pre- wanted to present that information to you um, so you would have it and you would understand when we talk about, for instance, the, the Church of God Ref- Restoration, what their background was. And as I said, they're an anomaly. And um, so I just wanted to present that out there. All right. Lord bless you, and we'll see you next podcast.